Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, AK Split Suit. Welcome to episode 10 of the vlog. Sorry for the long break between vlog episodes. This year has been absolutely crazy. And as you may notice, I'm not in my normal recording space either. We ended up relocating. We were in Florida earlier before this, and we were actually living in an RV. We we're in a 40 foot RV. And if you're interested in that, it is for sale now because we decided to change our entire life plan and moved out of the RV, relocated out of Florida up to North Carolina. So if you play at Harris Cherokee, please let me know in the comments down below. Not necessarily looking forward to winters out here, but I'm definitely looking forward to being out of Florida for the summer because my goodness, is the humidity just terrible. So bear with me while we get the office set up. Yes, I know you see a breaker box over there, which is super, super pretty on the wall. The wall art back there isn't even hanging on a wall. It's just resting on a shelf at the moment. So give me a little bit of time. I'll get the office set up, but I just wanted to finally hit record, get a vlog episode out for you and have a little bit of fun with it. So this session was played down in Orange City, Florida. This is one of my last remaining one, two sessions before we jump up to two, five for the vlog. And this is an interesting one because every single hand in the session was played against the exact same villain. Now, some pots are multi-way, but he's in every single one of these pots and things get a little bit interesting against this player because they are very, very aggro fishy. They got transferred over to this table very early on and the first hand or so, I don't have too much info other than the fact that they're aggro, but we get a little bit more info as the session goes on and we have to make some interesting decisions wrapped around that information. Let's jump into it. All right, this first hand, we are in the cutoff. Look down at queen 10 off. Our friend is directly to our right. They open limp. Side to attack 212, totally standard on the raise, totally standard on the size. Not too much reason to go larger at this point in the game. Kick called by the button, which I was not expecting. They had been a little bit tight up to this point. Called by our friend, not shocking. Go three way to it. Flop is 10 4 deuce rainbow. They check. I fire 415. This probably could have been a tad larger, probably 20, but I'm okay with at least betting. End up getting called by just our friend. Turn is a three of hearts, putting up a backdoor flush draw. They pretty quickly check. I fire for 35. And they pretty quickly check raise up to 125. So at this point, our friend had only been at the table for about 20 minutes and they hadn't shown anything yet. They'd been very aggressive, they'd been very active, but they hadn't shown anything right this moment. So this is kind of an awkward one because we're really trying to figure out are there bluffs or semi bluffs in this person's check raising range and then make a decision from there. And this is tricky because this is a spot where given how active they'd been pre-flop, they can definitely have two pair here, even though I wouldn't assign that to a lot of good players, but then again, a lot of good players don't open limp from the hijack either. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an inkling on who we might be dealing with here. But this is just really tricky. Are they check raising things like ace 10 and king 10? Or is this going to be extremely polarized and very weak side polarized? It's very, very difficult to tell. And they also could have improved with a bunch of different things, things like ace five and five six that are very realistic. And are they always going to take something like four five for a fairly fast check raise? <sighs> very tough to say. So you really have to make your decision. Do you want to commit in this situation with a single pair or not? And I don't think I have enough information at this stage in the game to say, yes, let's take one pair to the felt. I just don't see that necessarily being particularly good. Again, we don't have that much information on this opponent. And as such, I think hitting the full button is going to be a little bit better. So they muck it, we move on. Let's get on to hand number two. Right, 20 minutes pass, find ourselves under the gun, look down at Kings. No complaints about hand selection. Open to seven. And I know for some people, they're going to say, this is way too small at one, two. And at some tables, yes, at this table, seven seem to be doing the job. So end up getting called by the hijack and also the button. Our friend decides to go to 75 total, which is an absurdly large squeeze size. I decided to call. And I think it's worth talking about calling here because I think some people will make the mistake of four betting. And I think four betting is totally, totally terrible. So as it currently stands, if we just call and go heads up, we have an absurdly low SPR. It's extremely simple and we give an aggressive opponent all the room in the world to flop shove all they want to. That's a good thing. If we call, the people behind us are not getting a great price given the fact that the squeeze size is absurdly large. The SPR will be even smaller if either of them continues. And again, it's a very, very automatic situation. Sure, the ace is gonna pop occasionally and make things a little bit tricky, but it doesn't pop all that often. And as such, I'm very, very good just flatting this. The worst thing you can do is come over the top and not give an aggressive opponent all the room in the world to make their aggressive mistakes, especially if the SPR is gonna be extremely small and as such, extremely easy. 
So we'll just end up making the call. Everyone behind us folds pretty darn quickly. Bob comes out 764 with two spades. They shove it, and I very quickly put out a one chip call and show my hand. So, a couple things here. One, there is not a crowbar big enough to get me to fold in a very, very small SPR pot like this with an overpair, so it's really not a question. Again, this was kind of baked into the prefop thought process. Not going to be folding here in the slightest. However, I think it's important to talk at least for a moment about me showing my hand here because I know a lot of people in comments have been like, oh, you show your hand too fast. You should wait. Make the other person show. Let's talk about it for just a quick second. So there are a few different reasons why I just quickly show in situations like this, and let's just review them real fast. Number one, yes, it is my right by the rules to force the opponent to show their hand first or force them to muck. Yes, that is my right by the rules. Yes, you're correct. However, when I just quickly show, it keeps the game moving, and that's much better than spending two minutes with everyone arguing about what the rules are, or what they think the rules are, or calling the floor over, like just getting more hands per hour is worth way more than that in my opinion. Number three is a lot of people feel shame showing a second best hand in a situation like this, so I'd rather not inflict that kind of pain on someone who I think is fishy that could possibly just leave if they end up feeling too silly at a thing. Why do that, right? Why get why force a bad player to feel bad about what they're doing? Just move it on, show your hand quickly, go forward. And number four is that if villain finally does show their hand, let's just say you force them to show their hand first and then you show your hand afterwards, it really looks like a slow roll. And while technically it's not it still gets perceived that way and I don't really see any reason to do that. So again, I don't see much reason to sit here and try to play the rules Nick game and say, oh, you show first. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's just save some time, show your hand, move on, go forward. So if you agree that it's better to get more hands per hour than it is to be a rules knit and possibly make a fish quit, give this video a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate that. All right, let's continue rocking on. Very, very simple hand. Again, show quickly. Board runs out very, very clean. Our opponent ends up mucking and a full payout is coming our direction. So a nice little gift. But again, a lot of this stems back to getting the prefop right. And if you mess up prefop and decide to four bet instead, you probably end up missing this payoff a decent chunk of the time. So again, two major takeaways, the prefop thought process, flop definitely not going anywhere. And the bonus tip, just show your hand, get it over with, and get the full payout quickly. Right. A little while later, we find ourselves in the cutoff. Look down at a seven suited. There's a raise to 10 from under the gun plus one, two calls to our right, and I decide to call as well. And you could make an argument that maybe prefop is a little bit too loose. However, just my overall thought process when I'm in a game where there's a very, very fishy player is I tend to play pretty much anything reasonable and get involved in any reasonable pot that I possibly can. Reason being is you never know exactly when their expiration date is, and I'd rather maximize the chances that I make that money rather than letting another reg get that money. It's going to be much, much tougher to crowbar out of. So that's kind of where I'm thinking about this situation. A7 suited isn't the worst hand in the world, just kind of my overall ethos when it comes to thinking about prefop selection and prefop activity. Now you could consider squeezing in a situation like this, however EP2 had been very, very tight up to this point and I didn't really see any reason to think that squeezing was going to be all that great, so decided to throw it into my flatting range and go forward from there. So end up getting called by the small blind as well. A five way to a flop of jack nine three with two diamonds. Bet of 30 from under the gun plus one. Call by our friend and decide to just call here as well. I know a lot of players when they get into situations like this where they have a nut flush draw and an overcard tend to get a little aggressive. However, I felt in this situation that if I were to get aggressive, under the gun plus one can definitely have overpairs. And I don't think those overpairs are folding if I get aggro here. My image at this point was a little bit loose, a little bit aggressive, and I didn't see them letting go of those kind of overpairs, which is not great for us. And if they had something like ace jack suited, I don't think that's going to go anywhere either. So I think I'm pretty much hoping that they have something that's going to fold either now or later, and I don't think that's happening enough of the time when they decide to fire a c-bet in a five-way pot. So that's kind of pushing me more towards put this into my flatting range rather than go for a raise and semi-bluff with my a7 here instead. So the 
small blind goes away and we end up going three way to the turn. Turn is a seven of clubs. We do checks, bet of 100 by our friend and decide to call here as well. And again, you could make the argument of considering going for a semi bluff raise, but I don't really see it doing a tremendous amount. If this person has a jack, I don't think they're going anywhere. If I shove it, if I make a small raise, I don't think any of that's going to accomplish much other than just put in a even more chips, hoping that I have an equity edge, which I pretty much never will against their commitment range. So I'd really be hoping that they have like queen 10, worst diamonds a lot of the time, 9x that might fold, hoping that jack x folds. And I just don't see a lot of that being true. So I would rather just call here, actualize my equity, make river decisions rather than go for a semi bluff raise right this moment. And also keep in mind that EP2 could definitely have something like an overpair that they're not going to fold either, even if there's a bet raise in front of them. So I don't see any reason to mash it. Just decide to go for the call here, take the price and go forward. So our EP2 friend goes away. River is a nine of clubs. They check and I decide to check behind. I don't really see too much reason to fire this. They show a jack eight off and I end up losing this pot. I don't really see the fire doing much. If they have jack X, I don't think they're going away. So all I'm really doing is punting the times that they have really any decent strong hand. And if they have something like a busted straight draw or whatever, well, I have a pair and that's going to win against that. So much better to just check this behind, hope that you end up running into busted queen 10. It's not the case in this situation. Okay, whatever. Nice answer. Let's move on to the next one. All right, next hand, we have king queen off in the cutoff. Our friend opens to 10 from the hijack and just decide to call here. You could definitely make an argument for three betting this instead. And I normally would three bet. However, the big blind in this situation was newer to the table, but was also looking to be quite, quite fishy. So I thought that if I called here, they would come along as well. And we could take a nice three way pot with us in position with a very, very strong hand. However, that is not unfortunately what ends up happening. I end up getting called by the button and the big blind goes away. So. Okay, failed plans happens to the best of us. So flop comes out, king eight deuce with two hearts. We do have the king of hearts in our hand. Hijack decides to fire for 35, roughly pot. Decide to just call. I don't really see much reason to raise here. Just let the aggro fish just do what aggro fish do, which is fire, 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 and be prepared to get very, very sticky. So button goes away. Turn is a seven of hearts. They fire pretty quickly for 100. Call again. You can make an argument for raising in this situation and trying to get them to commit with a whole bunch of worse King X and possibly like Ace of Hearts only kind of hands. I thought just going for the call here and getting extremely sticky on pretty much all rivers was going to be a little bit better, but depending on exactly how you think they're creating their range on this exact turn card, especially for that size, because they have gone now pot on flop, pot on turn, that can definitely impact things a little bit. I thought at this point it would be better to give them room, and that's what I decided to do. Again, you can make arguments at every single inflection point of this hand. And they check on the river, which is a deuce of spades. Look down at my hand again and decide to check it back. And oddly enough, our opponent ends up showing king seven of clubs and we end up mucking this. And I actually think I should have lost quite a bit more on this hand. So nine times out of 10, I'm going to value bet this river myself, simply because we're looking at a situation where you have someone who is very, very aggressive. They were aggressive preflop, aggressive on flop, aggressive on turn, and then they check the river, which usually to me implies they don't have things like made flushes. They don't have boats. And as such, we're looking very, very good on the value side of our spectrum with our king queen. And because they decided to check, it implies either they have bluffs they don't want to fire with, or they have something like a short showdown value hand we should pretty much crush all showdown value hands anything like pocket nines or a worse king whatever it be i think this is a totally standard situation to fire that river and feel very very comfortable however you notice that i did pause on the river and i'm pretty sure i paused because something felt wrong the timing in my opponent's check just felt weird and out of sync and i'm going to claim that that's the reason why i checked this behind and got lucky to minimize losses here but more often than not this should definitely be a value bet. I'm going to say that I got a timing tell on this person. Hopefully that's actually true in the case. It's always tough to kind of say when you're reviewing a hand months later, but I think this is the kind of situation where again, more often than not, I should be losing quite a bit more. 
So they end up doing a little bit better than me in this one. They ship the pot. Nice answer. Let's get on to the next one. A little while later, we are on the button and $5 straddle. MP decides to call. Our friend decides to call. Down a king queen off, decide to attack to 30. Totally standard, size is good, obviously raising, no problems. End up getting called in both spots. Up comes queen, queen, eight with two diamonds. They both very quickly check over to me. Fire for 35, totally standard fire. Really no reason to let a free card roll off in this situation. They both very, very quickly muck and win a nice little small pot. So it happens, what are you gonna do? Move on to the next one. And last hand of note from this session, we are on the button. Raise to seven from the hijack. Call by our friend. Decide to squeeze this up to 35. Really no reason to flat this. Just apply pressure and go forward from there. Very, very happy if hijack goes away and I get cut off to myself. But that is not the case. End up getting called in both spots, which is not the worst situation in the entire world either. Totally comfortable with that. Flop comes out, king, three, deuce, two spades. They both check over to me. Side two, fire this out for 30. Totally standard two c-bet. Size is just, just fine. Typically going to be a smaller size c-bet in a three-bet pot anyway. And I didn't really see much reason to scale it up in this situation. And I'm totally fine if the smaller pet induces some check raises from our very aggressive friend. So hijack things for a while, finally folds, quicker call from cutoff. Turn is the four of clubs. They check, I fire for 75, and they fold before I can even get the bet cut out. So win a nice little small one, cool, no complaints. So our friend ended up racking up a little after this hand. I played for about another 45 minutes and got tired, decided to rack it up and head home as well. So overall session, not too bad. Ended up playing for about five hours, plus 345 on the session. That's 69 an hour and 138 BB per 100. And if you're keeping tally, I believe I won not just most of the battles, but also the war against our friend. Not complaining in the slightest. And that is going to wrap it up for vlog episode number 10. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you have any comments or questions, please do not hesitate to let me know. And of course, you can always ask on our Discord, redshippoker.com slash Discord to join for free. Over 3,000 players over there that are talking poker every day, sharing hands, asking questions, and giving advice as best they can. Plus, there's a bunch of our coaches in there too. Definitely suggest checking it out. Again, redshippoker.com slash Discord. And if you haven't already downloaded our new app, definitely make sure to check that out as well. Redshippoker.com com slash app or look for the gto ranges app in any app store either apple or android as always thank you so much for hanging out today i'll see you back shortly with a brand new video in the meantime good luck out there and happy grinding